Hello and welcome to this Interpreting Wine's first ever mindful drinking series. I am, of course, your host and podcast founder, Lawrence Francis. This five-part series will air between episodes 301 and 305 on the channel. And what originally started as a focus on non-alcoholic drinks evolved into a much wider discussion around mindful drinking, which I think, as you'll see, is really the bigger point here, aside from whether a drink has alcohol in it or not. That being said, this series features a number of voices influencing the mindful drinking agenda by focusing on lower or no alcoholic drinks. We look at cocktails with the founders of the London Cocktail Week and finish the series with a couple of brands who I think are making massive strides in this area. And without further ado, here is today's episode of the series. Today's episode of the podcast features Kirsten Robinson and Julia Kessler of Nixon Kicks. We hear their origin story and how serendipity led to them working together. We get inside the can and uncover the story of Nicks and Kicks before tasting one of their flavors, a delicious cucumber and mint drink, before hearing more about their entrepreneurial journey. Enjoy. So my name is Kirsten and I uh, also grew up in Germany. And background, uh, a little bit different. I was initially working in the financial industry for uh, quite a few years, worked for Credit Suisse, Deutsche Bank, HSBC, and um, decided uh, at some point that I had enough. I wanted to do something completely different and uh, came up with the idea of creating beverages and uh, found an amazing business partner in Julia. We've been friends for a very, very long time. And um, so decided that both of us uh, started the business, basically. And um, actually, the story about how we met is quite an interesting one. So we obviously are both from Germany, grew up there. And uh, we met at the airport coming over to London. So uh, as we were relocating to the UK, both met at the airport. <clears throat> Sorry, crazy, like full, fully packaged up. At the time, and we were still able to take like tons of luggage with us for free. So we recognized pretty quickly that we both were relocating, uh, started talking, and uh, then uh, became friends, of course. Uh, worked, obviously, uh, in our respective uh, different worlds for a while. And uh, funny enough, Julia then went back to Germany to work there for a while. I stayed in London. One day she contacts me and she said, well, uh, guess what? I'm moving back to London and I've already booked my flight. She shared the flight details with me and it was actually the same flight I was on because I was visiting my parents at the same time in Germany. So we met again at the airport, same airport, flying back over to London. And at that point I decided, hey, this is destiny. We probably should do something together. I must say it has come up quite a few times on the podcast I'm interviewing people and they do make some quite big leaps in their in their well in their introduction story but also like in their lives I mean in my experience it's been uh, sometimes from finance into wine you know like like two on paper very very different um very different sort of industries and you know they presumably look very different sort of the day-to-day -day. um so i'm just curious just to you know just to ask you to sort of unpick a little bit that that process because i i guess it's it's a big leap on paper you know from from finance from a from a, a career in finance to beverages you know what was maybe yeah the the hook that that kind of got you into to beverages and and, and why specifically this type of beverage so the the idea, and I guess that's true actually for both Julia and me, that we both worked for massive companies. So, uh, yeah, so, so many people in there. I mean, even in one building, you had thousands of people. And um, you didn't really feel like you were contributing to the end product as much as, as we wanted to. So that feeling alone was already quite strong. You know, creating something yourself. And um, I guess at some point in your life, you just come to the point where you're like, well, I've worked for all these companies and I've done all these things, but what, you know, where does this journey lead? I mean, what, what do I actually want to get out of life? And then we realized, well, uh, you know, like, especially in the beverage sector, there was this gap. And um, obviously it's a big leap if you're not in the be beverage industry or food and drinks in general, like suddenly deciding to do something in, the, in there was, I guess, now in hindsight, a little bit crazy. But, um, but actually, a lot of people told us that 
um, it's good that we don't have the background in, in, in that field because if you do, you probably would never start the business in the first place because you see all the hurdles in the way. We didn't see any of these hurdles. We just went for it. Um, and, 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 you know, we overcame them in, in some kind of way, which was um, amazing. And, and a lot of people say, oh, this is um, very unusual because a lot of businesses, in the, especially in the beverage space, fail. I think only uh, less than 10% make it past the first year. So it's a great achievement that we're still here, actually. I think it's, it's also, I mean, to, to Kerstin's point, it was very much driven by the fact that in Germany it's very, very common to meet after work and have a lemonade. And it's totally normal. And you're not getting looked at differently or strangely or, you know, and some people might even have a nice tea or what's very common is basically similar to how they build up a product. It's basically fruit juice with sparkling water because it's refreshing, but it has flavor. And and obviously here it's it's thankfully changing, but at the time when we started the business, it, it was still not happening. So when Cass and I would go out, and we didn't want to drink any alcohol, we uh, we ended up drinking a white wine spritzer because that's sort of the closest to um, juice with sparkling water and not too sweet. So then we thought, well, there must be something better, and we couldn't find it, and that's that's when we created it, and and it. At the time, we also had a friend, and he um, he was single, and he he really wanted to meet a girl, um, but he was not drinking alcohol, and he was <clears throat> he was sitting at the bar with his big cranberry juice, which was not the most appealing look, mm-hmm. and <laughs> and then we thought, well, we need to sort of break that, so that's why we we created the business because we thought we need to come up with, with a recipe. But it, it's still cool and appealing, and the talking point isn't around, oh, you're not drinking. The talking point becomes around, oh, you're drinking something with spice. So that's cool. That's, that's a bit different. So, um, so it was really driven by you know, our own need as, as well as wanting to learn and do something different. Okay, so there's no doubt about what we're doing now. We, we've we've uh, we've had a you know a lovely lineup of of uh, a lot of the drinks range here, but we've now cracked open three cans of the uh, Nicks and Kicks cucumber mint. Um, so yeah, it's a little bit strange for me to to be doing a tasting without wine in the glass. But uh, yeah, I'd, I'd sort of I guess yeah invite you to kind of do the same thing that sommeliers and, and whoever else would normally do on here just to, to maybe you know talk a little bit about the the origin of of the, this particular drink and yeah build on from that context uh of yeah who, who this is for and you know the kind of situations i guess in which this is being enjoyed okay so the cucumber mint drink uh, we created uh, because we wanted to actually have a bit of a taste experience uh, combining the chili in the drink so obviously chili is in all of our drinks cayenne and the um, cayenne by the way comes from bedfordshire so is just outside london which is quite an interesting fun fact because a lot of people think it comes from far away actually uh, the uk is quite a big uh, uh, country um, as in like there are a lot of farms that uh, grow chilies And um, so uh, the cucumber mint, as I said, was created because of the taste experience you get. Cucumber mint being very fresh flavors, very cooling. So the initial hit on the tongue will be uh, cool and, uh, yeah, uh, fresh from the cucumber mint. And then the afterkick is the chili. So you go from cool all the way down to a little bit of heat at the end, which just makes it a lot more exciting than your average kind of lemonade or whatever else you would drink as an alternative to alcohol. So that's the idea, just taking a consumer on this flavor journey. And um, so basically that, that kick from chili, all our drinks have that. But obviously the contrast is particularly highlighted in the cucumber mint drink. And uh, yeah, the cucumber also is from Bedfordshire, so quite local. We try to get our ingredients from uh, suppliers that are as local as possible. It's not always, obviously, the case that uh, they're just around the corner, but where they are, we will definitely make uh, take advantage of that. And uh, yes, it's just a very refreshing drink. It's not not overly sweet. It's it's just nice and refreshing, and a good mixer as well if you wanted to mix it with gin. There are obviously quite a few cucumber drinks out there in the market, but what we've done we tested loads and loads and loads of different flavors and varieties but what we found is that the best cucumber taste comes from the actual cucumber 
And so we don't just use flavors, we actually use real cucumber juice. And in our cucumber juice, we, we choose the whole cucumber, so even, even the skin, because all the nice and green notes are coming from the skin of the cucumber. So we, uh, we made sure that we use you know, everything from the cucumber, not just the, the middle bit. And, and that gives it a really nice color, which you can't see right now, but it, um, in the glass, poured in a glass, it's a really nice green color. Um, and that, that's because of that. And uh, who is it for? I mean, we, um, we actually have quite a wide demographic. Um, it's our lowest calorie drink as well, so it attracts a lot of um, women. Um, but in, in general, all of our drinks are quite low, but that one is definitely the lowest. And it's, it's a really uh, um, big pull factor with Asian food. So we are in a lot of poke places, um, sushi places. We're also in Wagamama nationwide. And the cucumber pairs really well with that fruit because it complements each other, like the refreshing flavors from sushi and, and pokey with the cucumber drink goes really well. It's actually you know, really great to have the context and have you here sort of explaining all of that to me because the first thing that I noticed as I sort of brought the, the can closer was actually the aroma. It's, it's so, it's like holding a, like a, a sliced, you know, f- fresh cucumber there. It's, it's really is, you know, super, super persistent. I would say the smell, it's super, super um, evident. Um, and yeah, I, I mean, I totally, you know, agree with, with everything you've, you've kind of described there in terms of the, the taste profile. It's not overly sweet. Um, it, it is, yeah, fresh tasting and, again, kind of real tasting, you know. Um, and it's, but it does have a, you know, certain, I think enough persistence, I would say. And, yeah, definitely, you know, on a day like today where the, the temperature is sort of, you know, creep, creeping up uh, degree by degree, this is, a, you know, a lovely, a lovely sort of drink to, to have on a, on a summer's day. And I think what I'd like to ask is just a, a fairly broad question, really, you know, a little bit of in- introspection and, and reflection, really, and, and looking back, I guess, on your entrepreneurial journey and kind of asking yourself a little bit about, yeah, well, you know, why do you think at this time, you know, you've managed to, to sort of, you know, thrive and, and grow up until this point when, as you said earlier, you know, there's a lot of people that come into the beverage industry, they have good ideas, um, and they don't make it. You know, what, what do you think perhaps has been the difference? I think firstly, we were probably at the right place at the right time. So it's also about timing. And um, we obviously figured out that uh, there was a need for something less sugary and less sweet um, as an alternative to alcohol or other soft drinks. So uh, and then also obviously the sugar tax is now in place and people are much more aware of the sugar content in soft drinks. So us being there and, and providing that alternative is definitely something that helped us out. Uh, in that respect and also us as a company the way we have built the company is uh, we were always uh, going one step at a time trying to figure out things before we then move on and and spend more money and uh, you know like rush into things we would always test things first that was always what we did when we started off in this uh, uh, salad kitchen in central london and we both just sat there and, and observed people buying the products. We made the drinks in the kitchen in the back, put them on the shelf, and um, we didn't ask for any profit or any money from that. We just wanted to really sit there and uh, and observe who buys the drinks, at what time do they buy the drinks, what flavors do they prefer, and uh, most importantly, do they come back and buy the drink again? And uh, yeah, that that's how we learned first at a very low kind of cost. And uh, and then once we figured out, yes, people do come back and yes, uh, there were certain flavors they preferred more, we then went one step up and said, okay, fine, now we can involve a manufacturer that can maybe make a smaller batch. And that batch we took to the London Coffee Festival and um, was super successful. We sold out on the first day. And that, again, gave us the confidence to then go further, uh, produce more and, and get uh, more customers on board and, and, uh, and grow the business from there. So, you know, lower risk, but uh, understanding from day one, who is our customer? What do they want? It's obviously the most important thing. At the very beginning, we had um, the glass bottles we could afford, or that was even that, that were available for us, because obviously a manufactured process they would they would put the lid on um, or the the cap on in a certain way. We didn't have all these machines, so we had to go with bottles that looked a bit like Tabasco sauce. 
So if you imagine like a red drink in a Tabasco sauce looking um, bottle uh, and, and then also with like a sticker that we printed out ourselves, <laughs> looked pretty strange. And actually we had people giving us feedback later on. They, they say they were stopped in the street by other people because they couldn't believe that they were drinking Tabasco sauce. So, <laughs> but like seriously, it was like super low key, uh, very cheap. Um, but we thought if people even pick up this, then... You know, once we have a nice label and nice product, nice looking everything, then it, it is definitely going to be a success. <laughs> and also to, to build on that, I think uh, with that whole learning process in mind, we um, intentionally didn't want to go into retail in the first couple of years because we really want to understand first where people shop, how they shop, and why they shop for our drinks. And then once we had that knowledge, that's when we approached the retailers. Um, but we are very aware that it's a very challenging environment right now. So what, what I guess really helps is that, that Cass and I, we do have that corporate background um, before we start a business. So we're always very wary of, of risk, and we are, we're constantly focusing on, okay, if we... If we if we have a potential that we might lose or win a business here, then we need to do something different on, on the other side. And and that really helps because I think, unfortunately, what, what we see in, in the industry, like I see so many uh, entrepreneurs, and especially in food and drinks, who have great ideas, great tasting product, but they, um, they don't build the company with a commercial view from the outset. And that always bites you back because you always think, like, oh, you know, I can... I can lower my, my costs later on, but it's not necessarily the case. And and people underestimate how much things are costing. It's it's very expensive to, to run a business, obviously. So um, I think that, that's really what, what helped us. And we, we had some great wins, and we, we love working with all of our customers, small and big. And we, we still have customers from four years ago who still work with us. And... They're, they're actually, you know, my my favorite ones because they saw the journey from when we made the drinks ourselves to today. So yeah, my customary last question really uh, is yeah to kind of finish on a future oriented note. Uh, I guess just you know at this particular stage in your journey together, I just sort of throw the door open and ask you to yeah look ahead. What what do you kind of foresee or feel is coming on the horizon for for you for the business for the sector, you know. Over to you. <laughs> so, small, small question. Yeah, yeah, big answer. Because I guess, um, of course, this is only the beginning. So we're available in the UK now. And obviously, um, very nice uh, retailers. We're in Retros, uh, um, Tesco's and um, Ocado, um, and, uh, but also the OnTrade and uh, hotels as well, like really high-end hotels like Mon uh, Mandarin Oriental, uh, Hotel de l'Europe in Amsterdam so um, for sure UK but also uh, now Holland and um, growing there quite quickly and uh, other countries as well Germany, Switzerland uh, yeah so we see obviously the same trend happening in other countries as well that people are finally kind of fed up with sugary drinks, they drink less alcohol they want something a bit different and um, it's funny that the UK is almost always like the first country that that kind of goes uh, jumps on a trend and then you can see things actually happening quickly afterwards in other countries so we just do it one one at a time not too quick of course but uh, yeah that's that's kind of what lies ahead yeah and in terms of industry i mean the industry is super super exciting i mean you mentioned at the beginning that you know people enter the non-alcoholic uh, wine uh, aperitifs um, spirit companies so we see that a lot and which is which is great because it generally raises the profile of of not drinking, and you see more and more articles coming out that even you know your typical after work networking events, where they always serve you Sauvignon Blanc, um, <laughs> they're starting to to now also get on ahead that maybe it's better to network without alcohol, um, and and that will that will certainly help us, and then. I mean, some, what, what we're sort of observing what's going to happen with, with some big trends like kombucha um, is obviously big in the US, but it be as big over here. And, and then let's see what happens with CBD. 
um, that's obviously entering the market quite quite quickly and big in the US and over here. So um, let's see if that latches on in, in Europe. Thank you so much, Kirsten and Julia. It was a real pleasure to share your story and tap into how Nixon Kicks is serving a real need out there in the drinking marketplace. You can, of course, find details below of the website and main social media handles for Nixon Kicks. And while you're at it, why not hop over to interpretingwine.com forward slash listen, which has all the distribution channels for the Interpreting Wine podcast and details of how you can subscribe. Next time, episode 305, unfortunately marks the end of this very special Mindful Drinking series. But we go out on a real high as I sit down with Claire Warner of Acorn Aperitifs. See you then.